I'm beyond honoured to be sharing my story with you today with one of my favourite people in the world next to me. I'm pretty sure I'm going to cry, so feel free to join in. <laughs> it was Thursday the 21st of June 2012. I had just celebrated my 50th birthday. I had called it my 40-10th on the invitations to reflect my strong passion to hang on to my 40s. I was driving to work on that beautiful, sunny winter's day, and I was thanking the universe for my life. Little did I know what the universe had in store for me that very afternoon. After a wonderful lunch on the foreshores of Sydney Harbour, as a thank you gesture from my boss for all my hard work, I returned to my desk and thought, wow, how cool was that? Then my workmate said to me, hey, what'd you have for lunch? I just stared at him. Something wasn't right. I just kept staring at him. I said to him, I can't find the words. Then I just went black. Everything went black. The next thing I remember, I heard my name being called over and over again. I opened my eyes and saw two paramedics urging me to respond. I had just had a brain seizure right there in the office. And just like that, my life changed forever. After introducing herself, the doctor sat down and said, Julie, you have stage four metastatic melanoma and there is no cure. She certainly wants them beating around the bush. With that, I stood up and walked across the room where I uncontrollably dry retched into the sink. All I could say was, my babies, my babies. My baby girls were 16 and 19 years old and they needed their mother more than ever. Scott, my husband, held me back to my chair, but I was hoping that the floor would fall away and swallow me so I didn't have to sit there and listen to my fate. She talked about various treatments available with very low percentage rates, concluding with an information session from her assistant on palliative care. I put my hand up in front of my face, gesturing for her to stop. On the way home, I remember Scott saying, and I worry about having odd socks. I was always telling him to find something bigger to worry about. FYI, three years later, he still carries on like a princess about his odd socks. <laughs> As we continued the somber journey home, through streaming tears, I told my husband of 22 years, the love of my life, that he had my blessing to meet someone else and that I wanted him to be happy. Then something happened. The green-eyed monster appeared and I suddenly changed my mind. I thought of him with another woman and it made me feel sicker than my stage four metastatic melanoma with no cure. And it was at that moment I made a decision. I would do whatever it took to stay alive, to be Scott's wife for a whole lot longer, whether he liked it or not, to be a mother to my daughters for a lot longer, to see my grandchildren. And then I promised my girls I would be okay. It was a big call, but I meant it. I was gonna do whatever it took. My oncologist, who I named Dr. Doolittle because he was never around when we needed him, <laughs> started me on chemotherapy. We knew that wasn't the answer. There was nothing else for us in Australia. So Scott and I set about our research and found a clinical trial in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> we had no clue where that was. The clinical trial was working with an immunotherapy drug called PD-1, now known as nivolumab and it was headed up by a Dr. Walter Uber. And we thought, this guy must be pretty cool with a name but like Uber, right? Somehow our instinct told us that that was where we had to be. Then what we did was nothing short of harassment. Calling, emailing, hounding on a daily basis for weeks on end. And then despite logistics, geography, financial constraints, and a very high degree of difficulty, three months later, and many tears, I received a phone call one afternoon from a lovely lady called Patty. She said, is that Julie? I said, yes. She said, this is Patty from Providence. What day would you like your appointment with Dr. Uber? I almost dropped the phone. Somewhere in the midst of our darkness, we could see some light. We were going to Portland, wherever that was. So Scott and I and his odd socks prepared to pack up and leave our baby girls behind and take the long flight to the US. It was beyond hard. 
We booked our daughter on the flight the night before. She was really suffering. School would have to wait. We left Sydney on a hot summer's day and landed in Portland. We'd learn how to pronounce it by then. On a very cold, dreary winter's day, contemplating the road ahead. We arrived at Providence Cancer Centre the very next day and met the amazing Dr. Erber. And yes, he was pretty cool. We then completed all of the tests to finalise my eligibility and I passed with flying colours. I later found out that this PD-1 clinical trial was designed to be capped off at 70 patients. It seems our continual and relentless harassment had paid off. I became known as patient 71. After three infusions of PD-1, six weeks after we arrived, we got the news from Dr. Erber. Patient 71 was responding. Not only was I responding, I was thriving. I was healthy, I was fit. Scott and I traveled through Oregon between infusions and we actually fell in love with the place. After 10 weeks staying at the residence inn, we were grateful and relieved to be offered guest accommodation across the road on Hoyt Street. It was comfortable and convenient. However, we were excited to be involved with the new housing project as we totally understood the need to have all the comforts of home when you have to travel so far away in such a scary and uncertain time in your life. The nurses at the cancer centre were like angels. Their faces would light up when I walked into the room. They made me feel like the only patient in the clinic. They made me feel special. So, how am I doing now? I have an infusion of nivolumab, nivolumab every two weeks, 30 minutes from home. I drive myself there and sing, sing along to the radio loudly and badly all the way there and all the way home. It's just like catching up with friends for coffee. My scans consistently show tumour shrinkage. My last PET scan reported no NO metabolic activity. I run, I cycle, I play touch football. I am writing my story. I kiss and cuddle my daughters. I listen to their problems and concerns and give them my advice. They don't take it. I am a mother. I laugh, I cry, I love my husband, I argue with my husband and I win. I am a wife. I am a sister, I am a friend, I am alive. But the best thing of all is that I am a much better, more giving and benevolent person from my experience with Providence. I now help others in Australia who find themselves in a similar position to me. You are my lifelong friends, Providence, and it will be long, thanks to you. To the friends and sponsors of Providence, on behalf of all the patients that have walked and will walk through the doors of the Cancer Centre, you are supporting world leaders in research and breakthrough treatments that are changing people's lives on such a profound level. You are the reason for good news being delivered to people with bad news, hope being given to people who feel hopeless. You are making a difference, you are changing the world. You changed my world. You have given my children their mother, my husband his wife, whether he likes it or not. Without your generosity and unwavering support, these amazing research teams would not be able to do their work. I have had the honour of meeting some of these people and they are crazy smart. And it is their smarts that we depend on to keep people alive. Please keep believing, keep giving, you are special people. People look for meaning in their lives, and I know you have found yours. To the staff at Providence, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for healing me, body, mind, and spirit. I'd like to give a special thank you to Sherry Scale, who is always looking out for me. To Tam, Kelly, Ellen, the whole foundation team, we thank you. To Steve and Cindy Harder, who patiently organized our travel, we thank you. To Katie for helping me put my piece together and to our besties, Monique and Ralph Matt, we love you. To Dr. Herb, to Dr. Erba, you helped us get over to Portland. You got me well and you sent me back, back to my children. There are no words, no words to describe. To my soulmate, Scott, I adore you, I admire you, you are my world. Thank you for sharing my story.
Well, hi. Uh, I, I was supposed to be here for all that, but I, I missed it. I was outside, come all the way from Sydney. I think that's the first time I've not been in with her, but I'm here now, so that's the main thing. So, you know that there is actually another Portland that's, that's in Victoria in Australia. It's a lot closer than here. But unfortunately, it's the wrong one. You know, the one we needed is, was right here in Oregon. So, we had to come halfway around the world um, to save Julie's life, and, and we would have gone to the ends of the earth, but fortunately it was only Portland, Oregon. And so, you know, three years ago when, when Julie was, was diagnosed with uh, melanoma, we were clueless about, about the whole thing, the treatments that are available in, in Australia. Um, but we very quickly became experts on, on what was current, what the percentage rates of success were, the costs, and the risks involved in different treatments. And I've got to say that, that uh, things didn't look promising um, through two and, a half year, two and a half years ago. So, um, having said that, we always knew uh, we were going to beat this. We didn't know how, but we knew. And one day, Julie's oncologist mentioned that the trials that were, uh, that were happening over here in Portland and, and suggested that it would probably be our best bet to, to get ourselves over here. So, so then started the whole rigmarole of, of the logistics of coming over to Portland. So, and when we heard about what was happening, we were very excited. Um, and all of a sudden, there was a glimmer of hope. Um, and to cut a long story short, we, we, we pursued this option like a dog with a bone and, and, until they, they took us on here in Portland. And we, I think we became pretty painful to them. But, but we finally got here and we left Australia on a wing and a prayer, uh, leaving behind you know, family, loved ones, friends, support groups, um, the whole thing, to come here with no idea what to expect. Um, we were fragile, we were scared, we were apprehensive. A, a whole lot of other emotions just rolled into one. We, we, but here's the thing, we didn't have to be scared because what we found here in Portland was support, friendship, love, a family of sorts with Providence and all the people at Providence who helped us. All the things we thought we left behind in Australia, but they were right here. And more importantly, we found hope, real hope that Julie was going to survive this. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all people who make it possible for people like us to have hope when all else seems lost. Thank you for allowing me to have my wife and soulmate still with me. Thank you from our children who still have their mum or mom, however you say that, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I think you know what I mean. Thank you from all our friends and family that we still have this treasure in our lives. We love her very much and we want to hear. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts and this time coming back to Portland, totally different. It was like coming home to our second home. We love it here. It's a bittersweet, but we love it and, and we thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>